Bunny Marcus is an award-winning entrepreneur, Forbes contributing writer, and executive coach. She assists professional women to successfully navigate the workplace and position and promote themselves to advance their careers. With 20 plus years of sales and management experience, Bonnie's extensive business background includes executive positions in startups, as well as Fortune 500 companies. A certified coach, Bonnie has been honored by Global Gurus as one of the world's top 30 coaches. Despite advances made by women in the workplace, Pay inequity and underrepresentation in top positions are still a reality. Unfortunately, the situation looks worse for older women who face the double whammy of gendered ageism. As a woman over 50, you may be wondering if there's anything you can do as you face down diminished responsibilities, decreasing visibility, and looming specter of being aged out. In her new book, Not Done Yet, How Women Over 50 Regain Their Confidence and Claim Workplace Power, Bonnie is out to convince you that, in fact, you can do a whole lot. You can keep your job, advance your career, do the work you love and need to do, and defy the ageist assumptions that suggest otherwise. So, Bonnie, welcome to Total Picture Podcast. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. So, so tell us a little bit about your background and you know the inspiration to write Not Done Yet. I never had the intention actually to be in business or to become a business executive and climb to the C-suite. I started out as a kindergarten teacher and I have a master's degree in education. And when my children were young, I got a divorce and teaching wasn't gonna pay the bills. So I answered an ad in the paper, um, and I was living in Connecticut at the time, uh, for a medical secretary for a large physician practice. And I went in and interviewed, and they turned me down, Peter. (laughs) They said, you're too qualified, and you're going to get bored, and we don't want to hire you and then have you leave. And I was almost like, please, please give me the job. I just want a nine-to-five job. They said no. But then two weeks later, they called me back and they said, you know, we're starting this joint venture with a healthcare management company uh, to open a cardiac rehab center with about 30 docs. And the healthcare management company is looking for somebody to run it, an administrator. Would you like to interview? And I was like, sure. And then I realized I don't have any qualifications for this. I mean, zero. Um, But I went in for the interview and I somehow convinced them that I was the right person. I was smart enough. They could teach me how to do the job. And then in a year and a half, I was running 11 centers for that management company up and down the East Coast. Wow! So that was my entry into into business uh, without any intention to do so. And then, you know, over the years, um, I managed to work my way up. It wasn't necessarily a direct climb uh, to the C-suite where I ran a national company at 50, by the way. Um, But that was by no means the end of my career. After I took that company through divestiture, I went on to be one of three principals of a tech company doing some consulting. And then I was running large sales forces for different national companies. 2007, I decided to leave the corporate arena and start my own business. And at the time that was Women's Success Coaching, it's now Bonnie Marcus Leadership. And my mission was to help professional women, as you said in the introduction, position themselves for success, learn how to advocate for themselves and navigate navigate the workplace because I just saw so many talented women being passed over over the course of my career. And I wanted to help women to put themselves more in the spotlight uh, and um, claim their value. Um, In 2015, I wrote my first book, Politics of Promotion, uh, How High Achieving Women uh, Get Ahead and Stay Ahead. And this recent book, Not Done Yet, Uh, was really the idea, the inspiration came to me probably about four years ago. 
I was coaching a 58-year-old female attorney who worked for a large tech firm in Silicon Valley. And she had been working for this company um, for about eight years. She was a valuable contributor. She'd always been a star on the legal team. Uh, but all of a sudden, she was the oldest. Right. And she started to realize that um, people weren't seeking out her opinion anymore. She wasn't invited to key meetings. And um, she, her workload was redistributed and she began to worry because, you know, once she has a smaller portfolio, that's like the first step to saying, well, you're not contributing. I'm going to push you out the door. So I was coaching her through that painful experience. And I said, this can't be isolated. There's got to be a lot more going on. So I started to do research about gendered ageism. And I started to interview women um, uh, who were in the over 50 demographic and asking them what their experience was. And that's when I realized I really had to had to write this book. Right. Primarily because, Peter, uh, gendered ageism is, is kind of under the radar. You know, not many people are aware of the effect of gendered ageism and that it it really it exists. I mean, we talk about gender bias. Right. Um, but the combination of both gender bias and ageism really affects women's job security, their financial viability. Uh, and I was thought it was really important to not only bring awareness to gendered ageism, but also to help women have a voice and to um, learn how to defy some of the ageist assumptions. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I've been covering this space since 2005 and um, the, the HR and recruiting space. And, you know, ageism certainly exists. And you know, ageism is actually an equal opportunity unemployer. It's not just women, but men sure. over 50 who are overlooked and ignored and go through what this attorney you were just telling us about goes through. They get gradually pushed out, you know. But that said, I think women still get the shorter end of the stick. Am I right? They certainly do. And there's research that um, confirms that, Peter that because of the emphasis our society put, puts on um, youth and appearance, as women start to show visible signs of aging, they are considered to be less valuable, less comp- competent and um, invisible. So they face it earlier than men. It's not that men necessarily don't face ageism but I think that women have face what's called lookism, right? Right. Yeah. And it's- there's probably a ten year spread there, where men over sixty start getting gradually pushed out, where it's fifty for women, right? So there's a ten year spread. Yeah, and it depends on you know the individual and how they're they're aging and you know all of that. But yeah, for the most part. Um, I'd say around 50 plus. Well, let's get to some of the strategy here. What, what's the most important thing a woman, woman over 50 who's either looking for a job um, or within an organization, like you were just describing with this attorney, what do they need to do? What, what really helps in securing their position and getting out of this ageism thing? Right. Um, well, there, there are a few things. First of all, you know, I think it's really important to be proactive. So we need to be aware that this is a reality and that it's coming down the pike. And, you know, ageism is one ism that all human beings have in common if we're lucky. <laughs> yeah. If we're lucky and we're going to age. Um, but I think women need to be aware that they may face consequences 
um, in the workplace. So they need to be proactive. They need to do probably some things that they should be doing their whole career, but now they need to be more vigilant about it, which is, um, for instance, letting their managers know that they have ambition, that they're committed to their position and that they want to uh, continue to contribute and add value and get input on what that looks like over, over the next few years. Um, learning how to advocate for yourself is a big one. And that's understanding your value proposition, right. how right. your work contributes to potential business outcomes so that you can understand how you can help the organization move forward, how you can help a prospective employer reach their objectives by connecting the dots between what you bring to the table and what they want and need. Uh, building a strong network and hopefully reaching out of your comfort zone and making that network uh, cross-generational. I think that's you, really important. It's so important. Yeah. Because first of all, when you're doing that, you become more visible in the organization. You're out there and you're making more connections and you're meeting people, which is important. Um, but also we have so much to learn from each other. There are some workplaces now where there's six generations in the workplace. Wow. And yeah. we tend to put people in buckets. We tend to put people in categories based on, you know, their age, their gender, or their education. And then we make assumptions about them. So it isn't really until we make one-on-one -on -one connections through, through networking that we, we kind of push aside, oh, that's a millennial who won't be interested. Uh, and we make connections so that we can actually learn from each other and push aside stereotypes. I think that's a really important distinction because, you know, there's the retirement conundrum as an independent um, you know, I certainly have gone through situations where my client retires or takes a different job. And, um, you know, then usually somebody in their 30s or 40s comes in and, and takes that job. Uh, and they want to work with people that, that are their peers. They don't want to hire someone who's reminds them of their mom or dad. <laughs> Right. So how do you? Uh, well, but I think um, making those personal connections, you know, actually uh, trying to go beyond right. what those stereotypes are and how we think people are. I mean, there are very many of us in the workplace who have managers who are the age of our children, right, who are younger. And we we need to lead with our wisdom and experience and our value and understand that we have an exchange of ideas, that we all bring ideas, that's diversity of thought to the table and to respect one another for those. Yeah, I think that is so important because obviously as a, an outside contractor, you know, I didn't have those opportunities often to connect with the millennials within the organization. Um, but if you're an internal person, you can certainly do that. And I think that's a, a really important strategy and something um, I think people who are watching this, who may be in that position really need to account for. So, however, if your hair is turning gray and you're overweight and you're not what most people would consider attractive, you're basically screwed when it comes to visibility and promotion within many companies. I know it's this is a very uncomfortable topic, but um, let's say you're not really attractive. How do you how do you go about managing that? Well, uh, you know there is research, unfortunately, that backs that up. That people who are more attractive, absolutely, yeah, um, go further in in the workplace and. Uh, it's, it's unfair. It's another part of the unlevel playing field that, that we deal with. And I'd have to, I'm not really sure whether women perhaps come under more scrutiny. I think they do. Their I and think I'm sure they do. That they do. Yeah. yeah. 
So I would say that's another thing that um, where women will feel under the microscope and feel a lot of pressure for how they how they look. Yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't tell anybody that they need to uh, improve their <laughs> appearance or, um, you know, there's no judgment. I certainly don't say any judgment in my book, but there are women who felt that I interviewed who felt tremendous pressure to improve their looks really, so that they could um, not even get ahead, but maintain their, their status over time. Um, but you have to also own your experience and the value you bring and stay connected with that and make sure that people understand really what it is that you contribute. So sort of on that same topic, Bonnie, when you were doing research for your book, Not Done Yet, what were some of the issues that kept coming up over and over again for women over 50? Well, that was a key one, Peter. <laughs> that was the, the pressure that women feel uh, to stay youthful and, and attractive. Yeah. And when I started to interview these women, I had no idea the extent of it. But there were there was one woman I interviewed who says she wakes up three o'clock in the morning in a panic attack. She would she's 62, she works in the fashion industry, you know, that people are gonna find out her age. And and she said, and then if I lose my job, then who's gonna hire me? What am I gonna do? And I have Botox and I have filler and I don't go into the <laughs> office when I have when on my birthday, because I'm afraid people are gonna ask me, oh, how old are you now? You know. So people really living in fear, women living, living in fear, women who feel that um, one woman who was a commercial uh, real estate broker said, I, I need to have eye lift surgery. And that's an investment in that's going to give me a 10 more, 10 more years of, yeah. of work. And yeah, so, you know, that's something that men certainly don't don't face to the same degree. Absolutely. So have you seen a difference between extroverts and introverts over 50 when it comes to promotions and job security? You know, that's a really good question. And uh, I don't think there's any research on that. We know that extroverts do better. Yeah. Extroverts. Um, and, you know, I was really interested um, to see that there's research on how successful extroverts are to move into leadership positions. The research is mostly based on men. Um, and uh, it shows that they are more successful in reaching leadership positions as well as income. But I don't know of any research out there, it would be interesting, Yeah. Uh, that says, well, okay, now let's look at this through the lens of being over 50. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you're, you're probably spot on with the fact that extroverts have a leg up here uh, on this issue, although uh, introverts often are the most valuable people within a team. They just don't get the recognition for it. There are definite uh, advantages that introverts have right. over extroverts. They're better listeners. They make better connections with people one on one. So, you know, they may not be able to go into a room and work the room the, the way the extroverts do, but they have more depth usually in their connections and they're more thoughtful about some of their ideas and, and their conversations. So I wouldn't I wouldn't push in ex introverts out the door. You know, I'm going to um, lift uh, one of your chapter titles for my next question which is how do you respond to ageist comments without getting fired? And additionally, how do you talk to your boss about ageism and sexism? Mm. Well, and in answering that question, I would have to say, if it's your boss who's made those comments, uh, then you certainly need to address it. One of the, you know, one of the issues that I think is important is that we need to build awareness, right? around ageism, around gendered ageism, because it's so ingrained in our society, Peter, that we don't even realize how many ageist beliefs we hold. 
Um, you know, we poke fun of older people. We, uh, you know, you buy a birthday card for somebody in this age group and it's like, it's pathetic, right? Yeah, exactly. And, I know exactly people, what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Like anything about, oh, I walked yeah. into the room where I put my key, you know, all kinds of things like that. Right. So we don't even, we laugh at it and we don't necessarily think it's ageist or call it out that way. But I I think that similar to before the Me Too movement, uh, where women felt uh, ashamed to talk about some of their sexual harassment or sexual abuse, um, they stayed silent. A lot of women will stay silent because they don't want to bring attention to their age, and therefore they don't um, acknowledge some of these um some of these comments and behavior. So I just want to say that before I get into the nitty gritty, um, because it's important to build awareness and it's important to have a conversation and let people know that their comment or the behavior not only may have upset the, upset you, that you thought it was demeaning, um, but that it was ageist, <clears throat> because that's the only way we're going to start to turn this around. Now, it depends on who said it. It depends on the relationship that you have with that person, whether or not you can directly have that conversation. You know, if it was said in a crowd, somebody just made a remark, you may not want to come right out at that time and say, wow, you know what you just said, uh, uh, really got to me because it, it was really ages. You may want to call them aside later and have a conversation with them one-on-one. -on -one. If you don't get anywhere with your boss, you can certainly go to HR and let them know that there is a continual pattern of ages behavior. But I would first give people the benefit of the doubt because I think most people don't realize that some of the things that they say are demeaning and ageist for the most part. So I'm wondering, Bonnie, um, now that most of us are working from home, are you doing most of your coaching work over Zoom or are you still having people come in person? And how do you think this, you know, this work from home uh, concept that all of us are, are currently in and for a number of companies will be in till August or who knows how long. Yes. Is that affecting this ageist thing at all? Well, I know that certainly it affects women. So we've seen how many women have lost their jobs. Right. Um, not only have lost their jobs, but have actually opted out because they just can't handle the homeschooling and the and the workload and and having a partner at home and you know it's a lot. Um, what I don't know is, and I couldn't find research on this, is how many of those women who have lost their jobs uh, due to the pandemic are in that over fifty category. Mm -hmm. I will say that. It is extremely difficult. It's challenging for women over 50 to get a new job, right. not only to get a comparable job, but to get a, a new one. So if women over 50 are being pushed out now due to the pandemic, um, you know, it, it's going to be very challenging. It takes much longer uh, to get another position than it would normally. Yeah. And of course, one profession that is overwhelmingly run by women is teachers. And that has certainly had a negative impact on women over 50 because a lot of them are afraid to go back into the classroom. Yeah, right? I think that's changing though now, Peter. I think, um, I know here in California, teachers are getting vaccinated right. and they've set aside um, enough vaccine for them. Um, I know in LA, there you know schools are going back fairly soon. Here in Santa Barbara, they have as well. Um, but they're they are essential workers. I don't know why they weren't considered for vaccines early exactly. on. Exactly. 
Exactly. So um, back to your book a minute. Uh, what did you learn that perhaps surprised you uh, when you were doing your research and, and writing Not Done Yet? I think I was most surprised about the extent of gendered ageism. I was uh, really unaware of um, how this was affecting women in terms of their financial future and, and job security. I didn't connect the dots necessarily between our society's emphasis on youth and beauty and how that affects professional women trying to keep their jobs or even get a new job. So I, when I started to do this research, I think that was one of the very surprising things is that this is something that's still under the radar mm -hmm. and we need to call attention to it. And especially, you know, International Women's Day, Women's History right. Month, we're, we're um, called on to call out certain gender inequities and um this is an issue that really needs to be to be discussed and to be included in um, unconscious bias training. It needs to be included in diversity and inclusion programs in in companies. So, what are the two or three most important takeaways from your book, from your perspective? That ageism, gendered ageism, is a reality and that it has a, a negative effect on professional women, not only women in society, but professional women and uh, their career trajectories. So that is probably the number one takeaway that I would like everybody to, to know. And then is um, the, the other one is how our own ageist beliefs and assumptions and stereotypes uh, hold us back. So our society, our, our culture has all the, these biases, but we internalize them. And when we internalize them, we don't realize that we hold ourselves back. So for instance, if we think that we're too old to compete or too old to ask for a raise or get a promotion, then we're not yeah. going to do the things that we need to do. It, it becomes a self-fulfilling a self fulfilling prophecy. So what I have learned in, in doing this book and a lot of research as well is that um, our mindset is a really powerful force in not only um, our careers and our, our future careers, but in how we're going to age. Yeah. You know, I'm going to uh, steal a couple of my favorite Tim Ferriss questions. If you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would it say? It would say um, over 50, not done yet, own <laughs> it, live it. Um, in the last five years, what new belief, behavior or habit has most improved your life? One of the things that I actually talk about in the book is choosing joy. I think when we make it our intention to look for joy in our lives, it, it really changes um, everything in, in very overt and subtle, subtle ways. So, you know, life throws us a lot of curveballs, right? That's true. We, we may get sick we may get divorced, we may lose a spouse, we may lose a job, but how we, um, how we react to that uh, is, is really important. And we can be a victim or we can really say, you know what, there's still a lot of a joy in, in my life. And I say now, I'd say probably in the last five years, I've made it my intention to find more joy in my life. And I have um, identified things that bring me joy. For instance, I've always loved to dance, right? Mm -hmm. So I have found some like-minded women here in Santa Barbara who love to dance. We're all over 50. 
we get together socially distanced outside with masks. And every Saturday morning, we dance, we take turns choreographing things. And it's so joyful. Oh, that's so and much that fun. And that just, yeah, that kind of energy per- ends up permeating your whole life, your relationships, your job, uh, your health. Right, right. So uh, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us here today on Total Picture. Um, what haven't I asked that you think is important to share with the audience? I don't know. I think you, you know, I think you covered the book fairly, fairly well. The, you know, there are three different sections in this book. The first one is to um, just identify and defy your fears and and assumptions around aging. The, The main part of the book is how to stay marketable, stop playing small. And those are very strategic um, strategic ideas on how to keep your job and how to stay visible. And then the last one is be your badass self. I like that. <laughs> Which like is how do you stay connected badass, to yeah. that badass energy? You know, yeah, that's great. Um, so what, uh, how, how can our uh, audience connect with you? What's, what's the best way to reach out to Bonnie? Well, my website is Bonnie Marcus leadership.com. Um, and you can reach out by email, Bonnie at Bonnie Marcus Leadership. I also have a weekly podcast, Badass Women at Any Age, which is on Apple and wherever you listen to podcasts. And um, I release a new podcast every Tuesday. Good for you. How long have you been podcasting? Wow. Well, I started this podcast uh, probably a about a year ago, I would say. Yeah. Uh, before then, I had some internet radio shows and, and things like that. Um, but this one, on Badass Women, uh, is, is so much fun because every week I interview a woman who has um, overcome different obstacles and really stepped into her confidence and, and power or and made a difference in the world. So, you know, often we look at successful people and we don't know their story. We don't know right. their journey of how they got there. So that's what the podcast is about. That's great. Yeah, I think, you know, podcasting, I'm an introvert and it's it's helped me uh, not be so much of an introvert. And I've, you know, through this podcast, I've had an opportunity to meet and talk to uh, a whole host of people who I would have never had the opportunity to meet like Bonnie Marcus. Thanks, Peter. It's been great. 